We, uh, as the children, have just hung these names on the Jesus tree. I want us to remember that the Jesus tree in real life is somewhat similar to a Christmas tree in that it points us upward. Uh, this month of December, if you are new or a guest here today, we've been thinking carefully about what God can do in our families, our relationships, and even in our ancestry. We've been thinking about Jesus' ancestry, all of the names of the people of God's history in the Bible related to Jesus, and how God has been bent on changing history through real people, real relationships, even up to the point of Mary becoming the mother of God's Son. It's in Jesus that we really see this Jesus tree. And, and friends, it's an audacious thought, if you think of it. God entered into our families our lineage. God entered into creation itself. The Creator became created in order to relate to us, show us a way of life, even to save us. So the question is, how is God's story of hope becoming your story? The story of your identity, your family, your relationships. And a real question is, are you living as an evergreen in God's spirit or feeling more like a tumbleweed these days? Today in our scripture lesson, we're going to jump forward to this timeless story Pastor Ken was referencing with the kids. It's a story that comes after Jesus' birth, but Jesus is still a very small child, and it's a story of we three or so kings who did not have a rubber cigar. Uh, they came to Jesus from afar. The story is in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2. Well, let's take a look at it beginning at verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Amen. We'll continue that reading tomorrow night. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for this reading of your word. Help us, Lord, in our seeking and living to find you and to follow you in faith. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. 
Have you ever been left in the dark? The British pastor, Jeff Thomas, tells of a time he was attending a Christian conference at Bryan College in Tennessee. And on this one day, uh, there was a gifted speaker, Al Martin, who was preaching in the college main auditorium when suddenly all the lights went out. Apparently, the technicians at that school, as an energy-saving measure, timed the sensor to shut off all the lights if there was no movement in the room after 15 minutes. Those technicians could not imagine a room full of people being so attentive that they wouldn't move for over a quarter of an hour. But the speaker was so riveting that when the lights went out, he just kept right on preaching, and the room remained in darkness. It wasn't until he finished and said, let us pray, which caused people to lean forward to pray, that the lights came back on. And it reminds me of the Christmas story, which begins in darkness, but then we begin moving to Jesus, and the light begins to shine. The story of creation begins with darkness. And friends, our story, your story of your life, your birth, began with darkness. You could call it a womb without a view. And so instead of asking you to be motionless during my message, I'm going to ask my friend Chris to just remind us of a little darkness uh, actually, maybe a little dimness right now. And there are two kinds of darkness that we prefer in life. There's the tired and in need of sleep darkness. And then there's the not wanting to be seen doing something you should not be doing in the light of day darkness. But even a good night's sleep has been viewed by Christians through the years as a reminder of death. Do you remember that short prayer? Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Yes, through the years, closing our eyes in sleep and entrusting our bodies rest to God has been a daily reminder for many disciples of our ultimate lying down and rising in God's hands. But darkness is probably the most universal symbol every day that we are in a world that struggles. There's pain. And in the story of Christmas, we can overlook this. Friends, darkness is a daily reminder to us of struggle. And it's important for us to see, especially in this illuminated time with pretty nativity sets, that Jesus was born into a selfishly motivated, power-abusive, and harsh world. And Herod, you could say, was the leader of the dark force. History records that King Herod murdered many in his own family, including one of his wives, her grandfather, her brother, and several of his own children. On one occasion, Herod had the entire Sanhedrin, the Jewish governing board, assassinated. On another occasion, out of paranoia, he had every man in Jerusalem who had any kind of status murdered. Herod was very capable of killing children as it's reported following the story of the Magi. He was a tyrant who modeled the darkness of unrestrained power. He was a man with a long and cruel reign who would not tolerate a rumor that a rival king might be born on his turf. His darkness was a mad desire to dominate. And so friends, I want us to think about darkness in our lives. What is the darkness that's been in your realm these days? 
I ask that because in order to find Jesus at Christmas, I believe you've got to face your opposition. You've got to face the darkness that may be outside of you or quite frequently within you. Now, for example, today we continue to struggle with the problem of domestic violence and abuse in so many homes. We know that 12 to 15 million wives are battered each year. And it's one of the most dangerous calls our police officers have to make. We know that in our civilized country still, children are killed, millions aborted, sometimes just to make adult lives more convenient, comfortable. I remember an article I read by Mike Royko some years back, a true story of a man driving home at Christmas time who saw a young person who had fallen through the ice. He parked his car, got out, took off his jacket, and slid out on the ice to pull the young man out. And while he was saving him, onlookers stole his jacket that contained his Christmas bonus. Yeah, it's, it's darkness. And it's in our world. Simone Weil, the philosopher, once said, the basic question of life is, what are you going through? And so this morning, I'd like to suggest two ideas that might help us, you and me, with the darkness we face. One is, I believe it's the darkness of human struggle that can provoke you and me to seek light. And here I'm referring to the light of God's help. If we're honest, you know, we're not typically driven to fervent prayer when we're luxuriating on a beach in Hawaii. And we're not driven to distressed prayer when we feel like we have that support and care of loved ones around us. But no, it's when we're in distress that we cry out, that we realize we need to change. Augustine, the great church father, once prayed, Lord, make me a new man, but not yet. No, it's when we're alone, it's when we're seeking, or really when we're shaking. That's the kind of darkness that can provoke us to seek God's light. The second idea is, it's the darkness of human struggle that can help you best see God's light. And I'm, I'm going to say something right now that, I'm sorry, it's going to sound like a poster from the 1970s. But stars always shine, but it's only in the dark when you see them. Right? So here's point one, friends, of the Christmas story, which is really square one for you and me. To understand and appreciate Christmas, why Jesus was born who Jesus is, you've got to begin with the darkness you yourself are facing. Confront it. Face it. And let it motivate you to move you, to lead you to finding that light which can lead to life. I call this second step the seeking of hope. What is it you are seeking these days? Because everybody's seeking something. But some of us just aren't aware of the paths we've been on. You know, many, many years ago, I could say my search engine was a little four-cylinder in a Datsun 510. That was my search engine. And I can tell you it was a slow search engine. But today, we are gigabyte seekers, right? I mean, information and events on our day, uh, stories about famous people, celebrities that we think will give us meaning or hope. A young woman was once telling her friends in a coffee shop, the man I marry must be a shining light when he's with my friends. He must be musical, tell funny jokes, and stay home at night. And her friend replied, girl, what you just described is my computer. A perfect mate is impossible to come by. And a perfect life with a perfect peace is hard to come by. And so we are seeking. And so in the Christmas story, in the Bible, we're given these wonderful role models of seeking, right? 
seekers who are looking for this Jewish Messiah, this Jewish king who will save the world. And they came from Persia? You can think of them as pagan Gentile scientists, Casper, Melchior, and Bob. And maybe they were on a research grant from the University of Iraq. Uh, and maybe they were traveling with camels and a per diem expense account. But they come wandering into our Jesus tree, right? They come wandering into our fireplace nativity sets today. And they come to be known as three only because of the three gifts they bring that are listed. We don't really know if there were only three. And for many years, someone attached names to these magi, uh, Balthazar, Melchior, and Casper, the friendly magi. But they were Persian astrologers. And in that day, uh, that meant that they were world-famous great scholars, like the kind you'd find from San Diego State University. Or the U of A, sure, U of A. But they were likely from the Iraq region. You can think of them as the original STEM scholars, skilled in science, technology, engineering, math. They were advisors to the kings. And we wonder, were they informed by some Jewish believers in Babylon still? Did someone tell them about the Messiah? Had they read the prophecies of Jewish scriptures? We will never perhaps know, but they began following this star. And their quest was, can we see him? Where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star and have come to worship him. It was God's sign, a star. When they reach Jerusalem, they rope others in on their quest. And their quest is to find this someone. And they're following an obvious sign, right? A guiding star. Now some believe this was a rare supernova that exploded in the night sky. Some believe it might have been Halley's Comet, which explains how it was moving in the night sky. Johannes Kepler was among the first to propose that it was the convergence of Jupiter, Saturn, and Venus converging in the constellation of Pisces, which has been known as the Jewish constellation. We might never be sure, but the Bible tells us that the star they'd seen, when it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And so, friends, this star search of the Magi teaches us some great lessons. One, it reminds us that all people are seeking after hope, not just those who are Jewish or Christian or religious. It's one thing we have in common with all those people out there in our city right now who aren't in church. We are all hungry for a kind of hope that helps us with our darkness. Secondly, it teaches us that God provides signs that leads us in our seeking if only we're willing to see them. Are we willing to see the signs God gives us? Christmas teaches us that God will give us the signs we need to find orientation to find Jesus if we are willing. In fact, if you think of it, God even gives us signs when we're given bad signs, right? Herod said, go search diligently for this child and then report to me so that I too may come and worship him. It's one of the most sinister statements in the Bible. And at this point, it, it's remarkable. God intervenes with a dream for the Magi machine to flee the scene. Get out of there. God's GPS way of saying recalculating. You know what, friends? I, I don't believe this morning that you and I are here now just because of a chance random accident. I believe we're here today 
because of a design of God. You know, this book tells me that our God is a God who pursues us, interacts with us, a God who is chasing us through the story of our lives, reaching out to us with never tiring arms of love to friend us, to save us. I don't know about you, but every time I come into this sanctuary, I, uh, there's a part of me that's reaching out to God, listening for God. I know you think I do a lot of talking in this room, but I can assure you I also do a lot of quiet listening. And God's Word reminds me, the Christmas story tells me, that in my seeking, it's never all on me. I do not have to rely on my strength alone to find this light and hope. There is one far greater than me who is in control of the universe, including the stars, who wants to lead us, lead you in a way of hope. And because of this hope that we find in God's leading, this hope is something I call the joy of new life. Those traveling scholars followed this star right to where the child was, and we have to appreciate their response. They went on their way, they followed the star when it rose, it went ahead of them, it stopped over the place where the child was. Look at this, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And here this English phrase just doesn't cut how the original language uh, so stresses. In, in the original Greek, it literally says they rejoiced with exceeding mega joy. It worked. All those efforts, traveling all those miles in the darkness, all those efforts of pushing through, following the starlight of hope, even in spite of King Herod, it led them to hope in Jesus. And why is it joy? I believe those magi knew that this was a child who would be a king who would grow up to say, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Albert Einstein was the one who broke it to us that the speed of life is a constant compared to the relativity of time and space. And we like to think that Einstein discovered that, but you know, we have to remember that 2,000 years ago, John the disciple in his gospel wrote, God is light. And that this Jesus claimed to be the light of the world. In Jesus, we have this word through which all things are made and all are relative to him. If darkness is the mega symbol of struggle and rebellion, you can think of light as the mega symbol of what life is and how life can happen. Even up to today, we are learning scientifically new lessons about how important light is. We're learning that students in school are more calm and less hyperactive when exposed to full spectrum light. Chickens live twice as long and lay more eggs under full spectrum light. Plants bloom and flourish. Restaurant workers are more congenial and happier serving in food facilities with good bright lighting. Baseball players are more confident and perform better when they take off their shades. Isn't this why in the story of Genesis, God begins by saying, let there be light? Without light, there's no life. And friends, without Jesus Christ entering into our darkness, your darkness, there can be no lasting peace. This is why the Gospel of John introduces Jesus to us by saying, In him was life, and the life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
And so I think the Magi's question should be our question on this Monday. Can we see him? How will I see him? How will I follow this Jesus, live with this Jesus? If you walk into any hospital maternity ward, you will hear that question. Can we see her? Can we see him? Excited family members to see a newborn baby. If you go out in our courtyard and find a new grandparent, I'll tell you, you'll be swiping pictures on a phone really quick. A new baby is a sign of the joy of coming alive, which prompts us to rejoice. And it's also the joy of new birth, which is God's reminder of life and light that overcomes death. Friends, the Magi teach us that rejoicing with mega joy is the typical response to the real Christmas. And we will conclude the Magi story tomorrow night. But for this morning, friends, two days before Christmas, let me ask you, what are you seeking? Because we're all searching after something. We see how King Herod was seeking to preserve his maniacal power at all costs, even if it meant exterminating children two years and younger. Friends, what is the seeking purpose in your life? J. Vernon McGee, the great Bible teacher, once asked, what is your ambition in life today? Is it to get rich? Is it to make a name for yourself? Is it even to do some wonderful thing for God? Listen to me, beloved. The highest desire that can possess any human heart is a longing to see God. What is the darkness of your struggle? And are you at least moving forward in a path to healing? What is it that you are seeking? And how is God giving you the signs of hope you need to notice? And how is the joy of Jesus that you find each day, how is it giving you new birth, new life? It was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the pioneer on death and dying, who once noted, she said, people are like stained glass windows. They sparkle and shine when the sun is out. But when the darkness sets in, their true beauty is revealed only if there is a light within them. Is the light of Jesus' presence shining from within you? The Bible says that you can be a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Let us pray. Jesus, help each of us, help me, help your disciples to seek you and to find you, Lord. Help us to kneel before you and to, in faith, ask that your light would be the light within us. Jesus, we praise you for being born to save. Show us your way, Lord, with whatever dark struggle we are facing, to walk in your path of hope and healing, and to find that exceeding joy that comes from your peace and presence. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen.